It's time for Pure Performance. Get your stopwatches ready. It's time for Pure Performance with Andy Grabner and Brian Wilson. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Pure Performance. My name is Brian Wilson, and as always, I have with me my co-host, Andy Grabner. Andy, how are you doing today? Good. Uh, it's been a while since we recorded the last time, at least where we were yes. both on the uh, on the record. Yes, yes, it has been. And, you know, uh, and, and thank you for our audience for excusing my absence, but uh, we had to get some new content out, and Andy was traveling uh, like he does, as as always. Uh, you know, it's an ex- it's an exciting time right now, Andy. I got to tell you, the yeah. um, well, first of all, it's the month of October, which means I can officially for this month call you Andy Candy Grabner. Bring that back. <laughs> yeah, um, that started a long time ago, which brings me to the second exciting bit that it's um, we're on episode 193. So after wow. this one, we have seven more till we hit 200. I think we've been doing this for about seven years now. I think which so. Which is yeah, pretty it's crazy. Been a long time, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I've uh, I just recently hit my uh, just last month I hit my twelve year milestone at uh, Dynatrace. Wow, which is pretty pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Been a long, long time. Been awesome. Um, but it's funny too, thinking back to um, you know when we started this all and where you and I came from. Right, we we both started in performance testing. I don't know if we called it engineering at the time, but performance mm-hmm. testing, then performance engineering, and then into this whole observability thing. But it's always been performance at the heart of it i know i used to only think that performance could be you know load tests right Mm -hmm. and as we got into the world of dynatrace and some of this other stuff there are so many other aspects of it um and i think today it's coming a little bit more full circle right we're going to be doing a little bit more of a uh, performance oriented podcast yeah and i also think right because back in the days we talked a lot about patterns and how to detect patterns Mm-hmm. And uh, I think there's a lot of stuff that we are going to hear today from our guest. And I think, Brian, do you think it's time to introduce himself? Absolutely. I think it's if, time. If, if he and knows who he is. If he knows who he if is. If maybe figured but, that out. And if he doesn't know who he is, maybe he can tell us who he wants to be. Right? I mean, oh. two things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I will pronounce uh, the, the guest of today with the way I would pronounce it because it looks like a German name. Martin Spier, but I will let Martin introduce himself. Uh, Martin, thank you so much for being on the show. We met a couple of weeks ago in Sao Paulo at an event, and now we're here recording this podcast. Welcome to Pure Performance. Thank you for being here. Please do us a favor. If you know who you are, introduce yourself, (laughs) or if you know who you want to be, introduce who you want to be. Well, well, thank you. Thank you. And hello, everyone. Um, Thank you for the invite. I'm mean, really, really happy to be kind of sharing a bit more of you know my war stories with you guys and 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 all the audience. Um, yeah, it's a very deep, you know, thoughtful thing, um, hard to think. But you know, one, one thing is for sure, I I do love performance. I mean, my, I think my whole career was around performance somehow. Just in the recent years, I've been more of a bureaucrat. Uh, but uh, other than that, my whole career was around that. I'm. I mean, I think I wrote my first line of code, really bad one, kind of when I was super young, was kind of nine-ish, I guess. Um, I got to experience the whole internet in the 90s when things were kind of fairly small. And it was a bit of a no-brainer. I would go into computer science, ended up studying that, and I started my career as a sysadmin when you know sysadmin was a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and by the way, I... Most performance engineers I kind of get in touch these days either came from a you know, testing background, um, you know, because back then it was kind of perf testing, and then you kind of go into something else, or sysadmin. You know, at, at Netflix, the bulk of, of uh, the engineers there came from a, a sysadmin background. Um, and you know, back then, by pure luck, I sort of got involved into a, a perf improvement project. Was application was slow kind of back when we kind of had you know. You know, waterfall model projects, uh, mm-hmm. perf improvement project. Uh, it went really, really well. We improved things. And from that, the company I was working at at the time, I said, hey, maybe we need a performance engineering team. And you know, back then, I didn't even know performance engineering was the thing. Um, mm-hmm. I started researching a bit more, and that's how I got involved into, into performance engineering. Back then, it was a bit of mainframe and you know, a few other things, not to um, give up my kind of age here. But 
ended up working in that, uh, moved to the U.S., uh, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15 years ago. I don't know, long, long time. Mm-hmm. I spent a couple of years at Expedia. Uh, so if you're from the U.S., you probably know Expedia, travel mm-hmm. agency, working really in the large lines, you know, lines of business, do hotels, air, cars, booking, all those things. And then my sort of random chance, I received a cold email from a recruiter in California. Um, you know, I, I knew the company, not just because it was a user, uh, but they also had some really, really cool open source projects back then. Um, that was Netflix. Um, and they were starting a new performance engineering team over there. Um, and this was, you know, over a decade ago. The company was really really different back then. I, I remember celebrating the 20 million user mark, which was huge back then. Now it's kind of a lot more than that. Um, there was only a few hundred employees. Um, uh, content development wasn't a thing back then. It was mm-hmm. just licensing. Um, DVD was still huge from those who are kind of not from the US. Netflix started in the US mm-hmm. here as a DVD delivery kind of thing. You went, you know, went to websites, selected what you wanted. You got a red envelope with a DVD, um, and it was a really, really interesting time back then because Netflix was migrating from the data center to this new thing called the cloud, and uh, everyone is really apprehensive about you know the cloud and suspicious. Should I kind of host my data over there, and is it safe? Uh, who is guaranteeing that? Uh, so I ended up facing a lot of the performance, architecture, scaling problems at cloud at first hand because uh, it was not something I could kind of go to Stack Overflow and ask how to kind of solve that problem. Probably no one kind of mm-hmm. faced those issues before. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I got to work with really, really great people um, back in the day. Um, maybe you guys know Adrian Cockcroft uh, yeah. you know, from Sun. Uh, amazing, amazing time. Try to define what architecture for the cloud was kind of what it is today, which is really, really cool. Um, I migrated to lots of different areas there. Yes, I started with architecture, backend systems, um, but over time, I work on client side, uh, which is not just your Android, iOS, and web, but also TVs and Playstations and Chromecasts and all those kind of weird things. Uh, there was even one thing that ran Windows C um, back mm-hmm. then. So in interesting times, uh, big data, which kind of started, be, you know, now is a huge problem. Back then it was um, something new. Hey, um, processing all this data costs a lot of money. How can I improve that? Um, and and now even machine learning. And machine learning is becoming a problem. You know, there's perf engineering teams focusing on machine learning, how to optimize that. Um, mm-hmm. And I got to work on all those things, but all with a sort of a performance lens. Uh, and ended up developing a bunch of tools. Kind of, we can talk about those things later. Mm-hmm. I uh, and about two years ago, I left Netflix. Um, and today I lead the, what I call the foundation engineering team mm-hmm. at PicPay. So PicPay, uh, probably most of the you know listeners don't know PicPay, but PicPay is short for picture payment. Uh, the analogy I try to make sort of Venmo kind of in Latam in Brazil uh, is one of the large fintechs in Brazil. Um, over in their 70 million accounts open, uh, you know, fairly, fairly big. Uh, and the way I like to, you know, explain what foundation engineering is there it is basically the bulk of core engineering. So everything is not directly related to a financial product, but everything that supports all those programs. So um, your uh, infrastructure platforms, internal platforms, architecture, internal tools, mobile platform, and I had data platform until recently. I sort of call it the plumbing, you know. When it's working well, no one sees it, but when it starts giving you headaches, um, all, you know, all hell breaks loose. So that's, and, and that includes observability too. Observability is one of my teams. Um, it's I, one of the teams I have a bit of passion and I kind of, they, they, they get bothered with me a bit because I try to, you know, give more opinions than I should, uh, but it, it's been an interesting, interesting change. Mm-hmm. I, I think when we, well, thank you so much. It's amazing to have somebody like you uh, on the podcast with such big history, right? I mean, it's amazing mm-hmm. uh, when you explain. Now I got to ask you a question uh, and without dating yourself, but what was your first development language? Because you said when you were nine years old, you were starting to code. Do you remember the language? That was basic. Yes. Yeah. 
That was basic. Yeah. It's funny. Wanted. It's for me the same. I, I, my first computer was an Amiga Commodore Amiga 500. And it was Amiga Basic, my first. Yeah, line. yeah, yeah. Did you have the Basic with the line numbers, or I think it was they had a version maybe Q Basic or something like that after? No, it was the line, numbers, the line numbers. Line numbers. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, twenty go to ten. Ten for <laughs> Brian, yeah. twenty go to ten. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, and I think that 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 helps, and uh, you appreciate hardware resources. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's one thing I. I I really love about performance. You get into um, how to optimize things and because you value hardware resources, which is something that changed over the years. Um, mm -hmm. um, a lot of you know, brand new developers, they, they work at a level of abstraction and everything mm -hmm. is abstracted, e even memory allocation. I mean, I can probably ask most engineers today, um, you know how your kind of language here allocates memory and deallocates memory or what's malloc? Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, most will probably... Uh, they probably never had to deal with it. Yeah, it's interesting. I remember. Go on, Eddie. Cool. I was just saying, uh, the, you know, understanding the basics, I think, is also a privilege that we have when we grew up because I remember, besides basic, my first language in school, uh, in high school, was assembler. So we actually had mm. to learn how to move bits and pieces around in the register. And it was it was really interesting, and and I think they really just back in the days. It was in the in the in the early to mid nineties. Not that assembler was still something you would code because obviously we already had languages like C, C++, but um, it was really great foundational knowledge that we gained. Yeah, yeah I was just going to go back into the, I don't know if you had it, you were doing um, Rational, right, Andy, you worked with? Uh, no, I was working with Segway. Oh, Segway, so yeah. So yeah, I don't know, yeah. if was your was the language C on that one? Because I remember in Loadrunner, we would have to do C and every, anytime we do a fancy function, You'd yeah. have to do the malloc, and I, I remember that confused the hell out well, of me. I, I, think, I think C was Loadrunner was doing yeah uh, C, but we were doing I think it was more like Pascal based to be honest okay. with you. If I think back, yeah, yeah, and Loadrunner was C, but it wasn't a standard compiler, right, right, so, uh, which kind of caused a lot of headaches. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so first good, good language, I think, yeah. And Go Andy, ahead. I don't know if you caught it, right? So he ha uh, Martin has a direct tie into Dynatrace because. His first, I think you said it was your your first uh, performance job. You were working for Expedia, which just made me think in, immediately of Easy Travel. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, right, <laughs> so yeah. you basically worked for Easy Travel. Easy Travel <laughs> is our demo, one of our demo apps that we've had for years and years and years for uh, for Dynatrace. Right, spin up this travel yeah. website that just <laughs> cracks me up. It was Space Travel can... before that, wasn't it? Yeah. Anyway, it was. We're it going was, way it was, too uh, back. Yeah, yeah, no, space travel was it's called something else, but something with space travel, yeah. Yeah. But uh, Martin, a couple of quick questions. So uh, in the preparation of this call or this podcast, you sent us a bunch of links. Mm -hmm. uh, it was one of the, yeah, as you call it earlier, before we hit the recording button, like your, your little baby. Mm -hmm. um, you have a lot of presentations on a Flame Commander or a Flame Scope. Uh, mm -hmm. An open source project that you um, brought to life, uh, I guess, while your time at Netflix, correct? Yes, correct. Yeah. Uh, we will, folks, if you're interested in learning more about uh, Flame Commander and all the other open source projects that, that were released back then by Netflix, uh, you will see the links uh, in the description of the podcast. But can you tell us a little bit about why you built this tool back then? What problem you actually tried to solve? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, it's... It, it, Quite an interesting and funny story. Um, so we had a fairly small team at Netflix. Um, I think at peak it was maybe six engineers to take care of all Netflix globally, all devices, everything. And yeah, everyone had a specific focus, kind of backend, client, data, benchmarking, kernel, um, JVM. And mm -hmm. I remember it was one of the most common requests was, hey, I had a real CPU regression or something's kind of weird with my CPU, um, new build. Pretty common problem. Mm -hmm. um, and this issue was intermittent. You know, every, uh, you guys probably noticed that, uh, had, had that mm -hmm. problem in the past. And this one was specifically hard because it wasn't even a second, it was kind of sub-millisecond, it was maybe kind of 100 millis, like sub that. Mm -hmm. And it was really hard to find what was blipping here. Mm -hmm. um, and then back then, Vadim, my, my colleague, um, he, he was having that problem and then took a CPU profile, sampled um, next step, 
and started slicing it into very, very tiny bits and generated flame graphs from those things uh, to say, hey, like, what's that spike? But it was really mm-hmm. hard to catch that specific moment. And then I think it was, it's, it's kind of fuzzy because it was a long, long time ago, but I think it was Brendan that decided to, hey, let's plot that as a heat map and see kind of what we can find here. Um, interesting enough, we could clearly see the blips and exactly the time frame which should slice things. And then I took it to, hey, let's create a tool on that where I can navigate back and forth between these two things, like the heat map and the flame graph. And cool, dev- develop the tool. Interesting, can we open all our kind of old profiles that we took of kind of applications over the years and see what we can find? And sure enough, there was a lot of really interesting patterns. We even kind of wrote a blog post about that. Um, mm-hmm. Interesting patterns like uh, your GC spiking or uh, jobs that kind of trigger every second or so, um, all, all sorts of things. And wow, God, there's so much we can optimize here that I never even saw before. Um, it just got washed in into the profiles. And interesting, there's just CPU. What else can I open with that visualization? Then we started with, hey, memory allocation profiles and all, all the BPF things. And uh, and it kind of grew into a really, really interesting tool. It was standalone back then. That was Flamescope. That's the open source version. And um, hey, we need to make it easier for all developers to um, you know have that capability. Then came Flame Commander. It was basically a cloud-hosted version of that where you could just point to your instance, uh, single mm-hmm. click, and take any profile and analyze that either as a flame graph or you know your flame scope visualization, go back and forth. It had a historical archive. You could compare kind of older versions with new versions of things, and it kind of grew as a you know, cloud, overall cloud profiler and Netflix. So mm-hmm. it's just that's the story how he created with a really really tiny thing uh, that yeah. you know probably most of you you know faced before. Yeah, and and so for me a couple of questions is so I think this was if I look back and also in the Git repository what was it like eight years ago, roughly probably, yeah a probably while like, ago yeah so eight years ago there must have been 2015. Obviously you said you were a small team. It's amazing. It's only six engineers taking care of Netflix. Now. Um, did you look for other tools or did you just say, no, we build it ourselves or was there nothing available? Um, uh, nothing in that or from that level. Remember that back in the day, especially when Netflix started, not a lot of observability tools were available that worked mm-hmm. at that scale. Um, yeah. you know, take your time series metrics, um, yeah. internally developed Atlas, um, still huge. I still don't know if any tools available today can kind of, you know, take, take on that load. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, vector, which was kind of real-time monitoring sub-second of low, um, big low-level metrics. Also, I don't mm-hmm. think I've seen anything similar to that that is not centrally aggregated, that kind of connects mm-hmm. to the host, kind of streams directly to the browser. Um, mm-hmm. So, yes, there was part of, hey, we, we like to develop tools, but mm-hmm. there's also, in general, there's nothing that can do what the, the level of granularity we want to get and also support our scale. So that's where yeah. we kind of went straight to developing tools. Yeah, Obviously, you were pioneers back then, especially as it comes to that scale, right? I think uh, now years have passed and I guess there will be there might be other alternatives now out there. But that's really interesting. Brian, this also reminds me, if you remember, one of the early podcasts we had with Goranka, who was a performance engineer at Facebook back yeah. in oh, the yeah. days. Oh, yeah. I, I, I spoke at conferences with her. He was taking of capacity yeah. engineering there. Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So we had her on the podcast as well. And obviously, Facebook back then, same same challenge, big scale, mm-hmm. no other tools available. And they had to figure out an, 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 a new way to get all this data from all of their hundreds and thousands of hosts that they had back then, then analyze it. Um, another question that I had, so open source, you or Netflix decided to open source these tools. Mm-hmm. And, and I think this was as a, as a time where, you know, open sourcing, I'm not sure if, if that many large organizations actually went down that route in open sourcing, something that was built, obviously, it's intellectual property that you built. And do you remember why Netflix decided back then to actually open source these tools? Because that's giving away a lot of stuff for free, eventually, mm-hmm. right? I mean, yeah, um, I think it's... First is part of the DNA. Um, everyone likes to have those discussions in the open, and also kind of 
discuss implementation and you know how we can solve this problem. Um, there were a few things uh, that I remember back then. Was first was the question was is it a competitive differential for Netflix um, if you know everyone starts using this? Mm-hmm. Um, if it is, we're probably not open yeah, source. No. It, it's just yeah. a yeah. It's um, but if if you check most of the tools, they're not the recommendation algorithm, for, for example, which is mm-hmm. you know close it guarded. Um, but you know, cloud management things that hey, if everyone starts using that, um, that's good for us. Kind of, we're sort of a standard. Um, we can all contribute and and improve how we use the tool internally too. Um, it's really interesting to give visibility to engineers of, of the problems we're working on. Um, it's a uh, tech brand. It, it's really important. We, uh, we're competing for really top talent and it's mm-hmm. good for, for everyone to know the kind of problems we're working on. And you know th- that generally comes to open source projects. So um, it wasn't like much of a huge discussion. Uh, it was just, mm-hmm. hey, um, if you know our competitors are using this tool, that'd be a problem. Probably not. Mm-hmm. Um, and then after came like how much effort it takes to um, manage those projects over time and, and so on and so forth. But um, the idea was generally that um, let's mm-hmm. just, you know, it's interesting. It's good for the community. Um, no competitive advantage. Yeah. Let's open yeah. source it. Yeah. No, it's good. And obviously it gave you a lot of chance to speak at all sorts of conferences and I have uh, just a couple of tabs here open on my browser. Uh, we, we spoke at some like uh, CMG Impact, I see here, uh, and some other conferences. So obviously, it's a great way to uh, to then you know speak about it. Make obviously uh, you know, it's kind of like almost free advertising for it as well, right? Because obviously, these conferences they are happy mm-hmm. that somebody speaks about their own experiences, and especially if the tools that you're using are something that everybody can then use and don't have to, to purchase some. Uh, exactly. Some, but yeah. And we love contributions too. I think that was yeah. the, that, that was really interesting. If, if people start using it, um, they'll, they'll find other uses for it. Uh, they'll, uh, you know, add features to it. Um, everyone benefits. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It goes back to that community that we see so much in the, uh, in the IT world of people sharing and, yeah. Helping each other out. It's funny too, because mm-hmm. in a way, without making it sound terrible, but I like the phrase uh, "open source is marketing," <laughs> where it's you're marketing your 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 technology staff for a cool place to work to help. Uh, okay. Obviously, that's not the reason you're going to do the open source, but that can be yeah. another factor. Is anybody going to get a competitive advantage, and will this potentially help us attract uh, more talent okay. as we're growing and expanding? It's uh, it's an absolute yes on the second one for sure. You know. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I noticed, so I, lo- I looked at the the video uh, from the performance summit. That was the first video I, I watched from you, and it reminded me so much about pattern recognition, right? But what we did, so Brian and I, when we started our work uh, as performance engineers, especially now with Dynatrace, everything was about distributed tracing. So I'm not sure how many distributed traces we've analyzed in our lifetime. But it's it's enough. <laughs> but <Yeah. laughs> the, the interesting thing is, we always kept looking for patterns. Like we always come back to the n plus one query pattern. Um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, too many threads being used, uh, the calling, uh, fetching too much data, making too many calls to a remote system, high latency, and things like this. What I really liked about the way um, Flame Scope and Flame Commander worked, I think it's Flame Scope with the visualization. Yeah, is the different patterns that you then could like visually see, and and I was just, it was really great, uh, folks. If you can, if you can check it out, I'm sure you have presented this in multiple different uh, presentations. But the one on uh, on YouTube is the one Flame Commander Netflix Cloud Profiler by Martin, and uh, you, I think, starting with minute number five in that video all the way until like you have like five minutes of just pattern after pattern after pattern and how it looks like visually. Yeah. And it's interesting. Every time we, we presented about that, it was always the same question. Hey, have you kind of trained a model to kind of learn those patterns and detect those automatically? Uh, yeah. That's uh, on the, at least it was on the to-do list when I left. Mm-hmm. But, but it's, it's so, that's actually an interesting thought, right? You can you can train a model to detect those, yeah. Because what Especially a human eye can do. Especially picture recognition. You know, picture recognition yeah. is so far advanced. So if it's if it's creating that picture, and then it seems like it's a very easy leap. 
Or, exactly. Yeah. And it's at scale makes a huge difference. Uh, hey, uh, manually checking one application, very easy. When I have thousands and thousands of applications, uh, doing that manually, it's a, it becomes harder. Mm-hmm. Reminds me of the fingerprint database and all those uh, detective movies. Mm-hmm. They get the uh, finger and then you get a hit. And exactly. <laughs> we got them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you know, Martin, is the tool uh, the tool still used at Netflix? I know you, you left a couple of years ago, but still, do you, are you aware? As of this far as I know, yes. As far as yeah. I know, yes. Yeah. Jason Vadim can compliment, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, with all the stuff that you learned at Netflix, now you moved on to PicPay, and this is also how we, we got to know each other because you were presenting in, in Brazil. Um, do you have a different, I know you have a different role now, but mm-hmm. I guess with everything that you've learned, uh, do you have a do you bring a certain, let's say, motivation into your organization around observability, around performance? Like, do you still do you take some of the lessons learned and make sure that in your organization you're doing things similarly, mm-hmm. or is it a different world now because a different technology stack, maybe different people? Mm-hmm. No, I'm definitely taking a lot of lessons learned. I think it was that was. Uh, one of the reasons I, I kind of joined was um, PicPay is a different company. It's a lot younger. Uh, well, it's just younger-ish. Um, and, but engineering-wise, it grew. the company grew so fast. And with that, you absorb a lot of technical debt. Um, mm-hmm. And engineering maturity didn't grow as fast. So that's what I'm trying to bring to the table. Kind of get a lot of the lessons I learned when Netflix was scaling and all the pains we kind of suffered um, during those years to pick pay, which was is in a very similar momentum, right? Mm-hmm. Um, just to make those things kind of get fixed a bit faster. Um, mm-hmm. So th- that's what I'm trying to bring to the table. Hey, let's have the architecture discussions early on so I don't really mm-hmm. suffer when things are just too big to fix. Um, and, you know, performance for sure. Uh, let's not get this out of hand here. Um, also, observability. Uh, the observability space, yeah, at least that is my reading in, in Brazil, and I'm assuming most markets that are not super developed, your you know big tech companies, observability is still quite young. Mm-hmm. Um, most most engineers in your team, if they did not come from a you know, big tech or a large company, they probably, their observability is, hey, can I go check the logs and scan everything manually? Uh, Mm -hmm. That's the background of of most engineers that never worked at at a company at, you know, PicPay or Netflix scale. Mm -hmm. Um, And trying to get rid of that thinking uh, of, hey, I can manually do a lot of things or I can uh, uh, publish text and scan text as much as I want. Um, And, Bring observability to a, a pattern, a point where I can scale, I can continue scaling. And that's kind of where we are right now in, in that space is um, getting rid of all the technical debt that causes problems. Problems mm-hmm. in, is too, observability is too expensive. That's the first one. And uh, it's really slow to find problems or understand what's going on in the system. Um, and that's kind of moving from scanning logs to, hey, uh, metrics and traces and full mm-hmm. end-to-end traces and, and this sort of thing. Um, so that's that's the maturity I'm trying to bring to the organization. And, and obviously, I, I've seen that. Not many engineers on my team seen that at scale. And um, so I, I, I do give, you know, I, I do have a lot more opinions than I should at my position. <laughs> Yeah, it's, I guess that's always hard, right? Uh, to uh, to sometimes not let your past dictate your actions. Um, but yeah, that's what it is. Um, yeah, you- there was a joke internally too. I mean, we working. I'm working. We're working a lot of improving um, app performance. So Android, iOS performance in the mm-hmm. app. It's a focus right now. Um, and I had to contain myself. Com- actually installing, you know, Android Studio and start profiling things again to the point where I took a screenshot of Android Studio running on my on my machine and I kind of sent that to the team and then it became a joke. Hey, Martin's reviewing your PRs now. Uh, <laughs> but it's just a yeah. uh, contain myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The I know we had this discussion also in in Sao Paulo because when you got on stage and you were, or you introduced yourself to me and you said you're working in foundation engineering, 
And then I say, this is something that I would call maybe uh, platform engineering, right? Because that's kind of the, the term that I mm -hmm. have been using for a little bit. And I think we, you, you agreed on this and also the way you explained it earlier, you really make sure that, that an organization, an engineering organization really has everything so that they can really produce great output without all the complexity around that your tool ecosystem brings and the processes bring. Um, I get a lot of questions from our community on what is the right thing to get observability into foundational engineering, into platform engineering. Question to you now, do you bring observability as a mandatory thing into everything you do? Or is this still, you know, your, 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 your optional or is it, is it mandatory? Mm -hmm. That would be an interesting thing. To yeah, sure. I, I, I like to see, and I agree with you, foundation, platform, different terms, but our reading is, is okay. basically the same is, um, end of the day is all layers of abstraction, right? Um, what I'm trying to provide to my clients and I, I, I tell it to my team all the time, I, I think of, our platform engineering foundation as a startup internally internally in the company. I'm providing a service. I'm providing a level of abstraction so all other teams can build their features kind of for the users a lot faster without having to worry about the details. Uh, of course, uh, the more I know, the better, but delivering that faster. I think that's the, that's the idea. And observability, when I... When observability started within platform engineering, um, that was mostly to provide a managed platform to other teams uh, being uh, internally internal hosted tools you know tools that we acquired tools that came to M&As you know managed those tools that 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 was the initial idea um and with time uh I'm, I'm changing that vision to hey we we actually responsible for the best practices and the processes and what's expected from each team um i i don't buy into the huge idea of, um, hey, something is mandatory for other teams. Um, what I'd like to do is to offer a better product that they would get somewhere else. They need to see the value of that. Um, um, it's just not my part of my culture of, hey, like you have to do that. It's mandatory. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's necessary for sure. Um, but I like to provide a better service, a better product. Um, and that comes, hey, um, here is your Java image that you use to build all your application. It's all fully instrumented already. And it's a lot easier for you to just use that and get all those things for free than having mm -hmm. to develop those things yourself. Uh, we come up with, hey, here's a minimum that you need to have a system in production. All those things come for free if you use our platform. Um, mm -hmm. You're free to you know, use whatever, but at mm -hmm. the same time, most engineers don't want to have, uh, have more work that they you know, need. Yeah. That, that's yeah. why you become an engineer, right? Because you yeah. don't want to manually do things. You want to automate them and you know, be, be done with it. Um, mm -hmm. And less work is the constant you know, search for less work. Mm -hmm. Um, and it it's a very interesting approach. I I, I brought that from Netflix. Uh, we back at Netflix, we call called that the Pave Path. You know, here's mm -hmm. a really nice you know highway you can follow, mm -hmm. and here's the off road path. Um, yeah. There's always cases that you it's you have to go off road because you don't have a really nice highway there. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, ninety nine percent of other cases, uh, it's just a lot easier to go go on a highway. Yeah. So you could call them paved paths or some kind. I think it'd yeah. be, you know, like golden paths, paved paths, whatever it is. But yeah. I think it's the way you explain it is nice, right? I mean, uh, hopefully everybody understands that driving on the paved path makes more sense. Now, do you, how do you sell your product internally? Or have you reached a, a status already where you said now it, it's, it's clear for everyone to use our platform? Or did you have to, do you still have to do advertising? Do you still have to sell it internally? Do you still have to educate people? How mm -hmm. does this work? So um, the current products, they're pretty established, I would say, uh, with like, a few exceptions. Um, it's, it's all about internal how other teams see our team as a reference. I think that that helps a lot. Um, if you if you work on doing your research and you know 
going through every detail, um, listening to everyone on their input and like, before you make a decision and then kind of you, you do the job. Um, it's You don't need a lot of internal marketing. Um, people just mm-hmm. look at you and, hey, um, I, I trust that they did the, the homework and mm-hmm. I'll, 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 I'll follow. So, but obviously there are always um, – Oh, technologies that you don't have a full consensus for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, it, mm-hmm. it always always happens, um, and, and on those cases, kind of we have to do a bit more marketing, a bit more education, and kind of go. To, I always try to bring the discussion to a technical discussion, um, mm-hmm. uh, but not a lot of marketing. Um, mm-hmm. It's and, and once you standardize things, it's I, I joke with the kind of Apple environment. Oh, everything works nicely together here. Once you step out, everything becomes a lot harder. Mm-hmm. Um, it's good or bad. But mm-hmm. um, if you're in the environment, everything comes for free. It's a lot easier. Um, everyone tested your path and uh, whatever you need to do um, has a really nice documentation. It's just mm-hmm. easier. Mm-hmm. I thought of a marketing poster you can hang in the office so people have an idea so on the paved path you can have an engineer in a lap with a laptop and a self-driven car on a smooth road typing away with no problem getting their work done for the off-road path they're going to be in a big jeep wrangler on a big rocky road bouncing around as they're trying to type and drive at the same time you know and to yeah. take your pick man <laughs> and I, I, I do i do like the off-road bit that's just our, as an engineer but yeah. at the same time I work for a bank. Uh, it's it's yeah. not the right place to uh, be be doing that. But do, you, but do you want to try typing while you're driving and bouncing? That's yeah, the bit, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's interesting too, because Andy, when we talked a lot about platform engineering as well, there's the idea. You know, I like the terms paved path and you know unpaved road um, better than opinionated, right? But mm-hmm. there's it's similar concept to the here's here's the 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 one where you have your rules. It's all set up, but it's easier to go. Um, I, I like that though. You're giving the, you're keeping it open, right? You're letting the engineers make the choice. You're trying to inform them and educate them about the pros and cons. And obviously if there's a reason why they should pick the unpaved road, you know, just like the reason yeah. why you pick any technology is because there is a reason, but it gets them to think about it. And I think it's more powerful if they come to the decision to do the paved path because they realize that's the better path as a being opposed mm-hmm. to just like, no, this is what you do. So yeah, it's interesting and, and to see a, how that'll work. It's exactly the case because even if you try to provide a platform um, that will cover all use cases, that'll never be the case. You know, you always have exceptions and things you don't mm-hmm. want to support uh, as a central team just because it's one corner case there um, and it makes no sense for us to um, invest a lot of time and effort and people to support that specific one use case for kind of one team. Um, and there's always cases like that in a large company. You'll never be able to standardize everything. Um, sometimes you might have a Windows server running Lua there because that one solution that they bought and it needs to be that one. And, and you always have cases like that. Um, and when you try to impose things, you always forget about the corner cases. Hmm. Yeah, back when I was at uh, WebMD, there was a team that had a tool written in Fox Pro, which I'd never heard of until that came out. And they're like, well, we need to make it work because it's no longer being made or maintained. So I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> but that's the case just bringing that up for the old language nod the quick question for you now coming back to where we all started where we started all in performance engineering um, do you now at peak pay where do you do performance engineering do you still do performance testing as part of your delivery pipeline or is it more everything moved to production where you're basically analyzing performance behavior and performance changes as part of a, a production, let's say a blue green rollout or a canary rollout. How does this, what, what do you do? Mm-hmm. So it's, uh, there is performance testing, but it's ad hoc on specific cases. Um, and it's the same in Netflix. I can tell you the whole story kind of went, because I, I remember the first thing I did when I joined was creating a performance, fully automated perf test framework. Um, so ad hoc cases, um, there is a completely new application. I have no idea how it behaves. Mm. I, I need to put some load in and we'll see how it behaves. Mm. It's, it's not to validate. It's not a regression test. It's nothing like that. It's just, I want to see how it behaves with load. 
That's it. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a patch or there is a new library version or there's something that changed that mm-hmm. is risky. Um, mm-hmm. I, I want to see how it behaves and kind of what's the difference in product. It does, I don't need to match production workload or anything like that. I just yeah, want yeah. to see how it behaves in behaves under load um, and, and try to find any issues before production. Um, to guarantee production is working, it's part of the development process, I guess. I think that's the um, same as on Netflix. Um, Canary releases, I think mm-hmm. that's the first. Um, and with that, during the Canary, you, you need perf metrics there. Um, have you regressed CPU significantly? Um, have you regressed your memory allocations? Um, are you generating errors? Uh, you mm-hmm. know, whatever you can think of um, should be there, should be in, in the canary evaluation. If you do that automatically, mm-hmm. manually, but it should be part of the evaluation to see how things behave um, in production. Um, Blue green helps, even if you didn't catch whatever you had to catch during canary. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, you'll catch that um, in a blue green. Uh, and Netflix, we call that red black. Um, but it's exactly the same path I'm seeing in every single company. And that happened at PicPay before I joined. Uh, and I think it was exactly like that. You get to a scale where it's just really, 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 really hard to mm-hmm. test things pre-production. Uh, um, not just because of the scale and the load you need to generate. There's always ways of kind of achieving that. But the system became too complex for you to simulate all weird things that can happen. Um, mm. Get in an environment with the right configuration really, really hard. You have feature flags. You have things that change the behavior of the system. You have different versions of applications. Having a, a separate environment uh, that scales or it's a, it's a you know have data from that's similar to production. So the test of value is just too many variables to mm-hmm. know pre-production. And at the same time, we're releasing multiple times a day every application, so there's not a lot of time to test anything pre-production to make sure um, there's no regression. Keeping those tests updated, Netflix was fairly simple in use ca- user use cases. You know, uh, PicPay is huge, huge of features, uh, what's available to the user. So keeping that to test something end-to-end, really, really hard. Mm-hmm. So it just it became really hard to test things pre-production, and um, we have to kind of rely on the actual development and deploy processes to um, catch those catch those problems. Mm-hmm. And is I the um, well, so one, one more question on that? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, obviously doing the load tests are different, but one thing I didn't know again until I got more into Dynatrace, you know, the understanding that performance is more than just load. In those pre-production environments, are you at least looking for patterns on you know when you're not under load? Andy mentioned like the n plus one query problem, or you know single execution CPU utilization is more, the number of calls to the database is more, things that might indicate uh, a potential problem uh, that gets exasperated under load. Is that being looked at, or is it you know? And and I don't even know if the flame yeah. uh, the flame thing can can help with that because it's not really going to be quite under load, but you know, just imagine mm-hmm. there's there's a, there there are a lot of common issues, um, and I'm just thinking on the AI side. If you have a mm-hmm. picture of what that looks like, you can do a comparison. But yeah, right that... now it's not part of you know your everyday engineer, everyday developer life. If obviously if there is a suspicion that something um, you know might be bad or I'm not sure, yes, all the tools we have available allow for that at least um, to how to investigate that in pre-production environments for sure not part of the process um, as a kind of day to day but you know if you're an engineer you, you, you smell when things can go bad uh, I'm adding this SDK and for some reason it's a lot larger than the previous one hmm, interesting mm-hmm. kind of let me see what's going on here or hey I developed this algorithm here but you know uh, c- quite complex. Like, let me see how it behaves. Or I'm adding this dependency here, external call or whatever. Interesting. Let me see how that behaves in a non-production environment. It's just, you, you know things that are risky when you touch them, and it, it hopefully it's a trigger for you to investigate a bit more. Yeah, Martin, I got one final question, because I think then we're getting almost to the end. Now, it seems that at Netflix you were obviously heavily looking at metrics, right? Like your infrastructure metrics and so on. Now with the whole, let's say, uh, excitement about open telemetry, 
and the traces even though traces has been around you know for for, for a long long time but it's it's been really made popular obviously with open telemetry and all the tools that came with it do you now see the benefit of having all these additional signals be, besides your metrics and your logs do you also look at mm-hmm. traces do you look at real user data and all this stuff oh yeah of course of course even even in netflix we um Developed a kind of you know, end-to-end kind of distributed tracing mm-hmm. um, solution. Uh, back then, it was internally developed. Back in the day, it was internally developed. Today, I think it's Zipkin based. When I left, it was Zipkin based. Mm-hmm. Um, what's the Google paper? It was Dapper? Dapper? Dapper. Yeah. Dapper. Dapper yeah. Exactly. It was based on that. Um, internally, mm-hmm. I think we called Salt. Uh, and Extremely, extremely important, especially to understand um, a large and complex environment and the dependencies and when something breaks. I ended up even developing a bunch of um, tools, a few open source, I think. I'm trying to remember mm-hmm. if any of the open source tools are there um, uh, that are based on tracing data, for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, take, for example, uh, so I develop a tool to visualize low of volume volume of requests versus time so where am i spending time i have a request that comes to my edge layer and uh, have you seen the sankey diagrams kind of yeah, uh, yeah, they kind of open yeah. up so i use the sankey diagram based on tracing to see where we're spending time yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. that compose the time i guess to um the um the edge layer request itself mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so very interesting uh, super important to have um the tracing data there um, in, a, in a constant changing environment too, which is you, you have a company with kind of thousands of microservices, those things are changing all the time. Um, I, I, I remember in the early days when I tried to design a, you know, do a design of the architecture, you know, where the requests go and et cetera. By the time I finished, you know, a couple of days later, it already changed. Mm-hmm. So the only of understanding how like the, the flow of data and the flow of requests in a system is through tracing. Uh, yeah. So extremely, extremely important. The, yeah, the, the, yeah the, the data structure I don't like very much is logging just because it doesn't scale really well. Mm-hmm. Tracing, metrics, super, super important. Cool. Hey, Martin, uh, thank you so much for, for taking time out of your day. I... I'm sure you're super busy with your role at PicPay. Thank you for giving us all the insights into what you've learned over the years. Uh, it was great to hear that your first programming language was basic, kind of <laughs> brought back some memories from my own uh, childhood. Uh, I uh, yeah, I hope our paths will cross again. I know you are currently in Texas. I will be in Texas, by the way, uh, first uh, first of, after KubeCon, the week after KubeCon. Nice. I'm not sure if you make it to KubeCon. If you make it to KubeCon, visit us there as well. All right, yeah, not scheduled, but yeah, if, you, if you're around, let's, uh, let's have a beer. Let's have a beer, yeah, sounds good. Brian, any final words from you? Yeah, um, well, first of all, thank you as well. Um, two, two more thoughts that I didn't get in the beginning, right? Number one is that, uh, you know, thank you also to all of our listeners. Uh, you know, we wouldn't be able to talk to amazing guests like Martin, and, you know, Andy and I learn so much from this as always, and hopefully you're all learning. And the other, the other special thing about today so, Martin, you're in Texas. You're not too far away. We might cross paths because um, today is um, 5G zombie day, if no one knew about this, right? So, in the United States, they're doing a testing of the federal um, emergency broadcasting. And the latest conspiracy on that is that's going to trigger, I don't know if it's the COVID microchips that are supposedly been into us, but it's going to turn us all to zombies. So, Martin, if that happens, I'll meet you on the field eating brains together and... Uh, Andy, yeah, I guess maybe travel to the United States might be restricted because it'll be a zombie yeah. land. Exactly. So, <laughs> to all of our listeners, to all of our future zombie listeners, uh, thank you. <laughs> um, Martin, it's been a real pleasure. And um, yeah, you have any uh, any last things you want to get in there, Martin, as well? No, just really, really thank you. Thank you for the chance of you know sharing again my war stories here. Um, all, all, always eager to you know chat performance. So, but it's as you guys noticed, that's something I'm really, really passionate about. Yep. And again, I, I always mention that. I mean, it, it's a very small world. You know, um, mm-hmm. we they tend to kind of bump into each other at conferences and and you name it. Uh, so you know, listeners, you guys, anyone, you know, if you want to chat performance or anything, it's always feel free to kind of reach out. You know, I think you guys will share links to kind of LinkedIn and all mm-hmm. those things. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm 
I'm always eager to, to chat to like-minded folks. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for giving back to everybody with your projects and everything else. So, All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next time. And happy October. <laughs>